Hi everyone. I want to thank you for jumping in on this video. I realize it would be better if we were in person this week, but given circumstances, obviously I'm not able to be in person. So in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to touch on how fintech is altering trading in our, what I might define as lit traditional asset markets. So what I'll do is I'll briefly review the traditional lit public asset markets, or more specifically, the exchanges. And then I'll talk about the changes to those exchanges, the main exchanges over the past couple of decades. And then finally, I'll talk about some of the changes that have come about in those markets, or, or rather with respect to the exchanges and dark pools and payment for order flow and how that's affected the brokerage industry in the United States. All right, so let's talk about first how traditional exchanges work. Well, a securities exchange is just a market where traders can buy and sell various securities. So these include stock exchanges, bond exchanges, which are far less common than stock exchanges. You can have options or more commonly just broader derivatives exchanges. ETFs can trade on an exchange. Certainly currency can be exchanged. This is why we have Forex markets. And you can also see mutual fund shares being traded on exchanges. Now, historically, these exchanges were open outcry markets. As you can see in this photo here from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, a lot of people standing around these pits trading shares. This is how the New York Stock Exchange used to work. Nowadays, it is, I mean, this is archaic. Uh, historically, you'd have someone who Nowadays, they're called the designated market maker. They stand in front of a computer and they make the market for a stock. Nowadays, very few exchanges have in-person trading. I think the New York Stock Exchange is one of the very few markets that still has a floor, uh, although nowadays the New York Stock Exchange is a hybrid market, meaning that it has both a floor where you can physically trade securities and it also has the online market where most of the shares of securities trade day to day. Other exchanges like the NASDAQ are entirely electronic. So there is no floor for the NASDAQ. There is no floor for some of these other markets like the BATS. And historically, in the last 10 years, most of the, the trading that occurs on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange is eh, large orders. Okay. So how many different exchanges exist? Well, there are currently approximately 60 large stock exchanges around the world, and these exchanges are spread out all across the world. So several of our largest markets are going to be in the U.S., namely the New York Stock Exchange, or NYSE, and the NASDAQ. But we also have some very large markets in Europe and Asia. So Euronext is a large market, London Stock Exchange, again, very large. The third largest market in the world today is actually going to be the, the Shanghai stock, although there are others spread out around the world. We also have many derivatives exchanges, and these exchanges are going to trade all manner of derivatives. So for example, these derivatives exchanges might trade commodities, index futures, currencies, so these would be our Forex markets. We have assets or securities like STRS, uh, we have ETF futures. There's all kinds of derivatives whose value is backed by some underlying asset, whether real or uh, security. And you know the most commonly traded derivatives or the largest number of derivatives markets are going to involve commodities and stock index futures. And then lastly, we can also have ETF or mutual fund shares traded on exchanges. Like, for example, the New York Stock Exchange allows ETFs to trade very much like stocks. Now, the downside is that while we have a lot of exchanges for equities and commodities and other asset classes, there's not that many bond exchanges. And the reason for this is because there are so many different issuances of bonds. A good example of this might be with Ford. Ford Motor Company historically has had dozens of different bond issuances outstanding at any given time over the last 10 years. I think the last time I had students analyzing it in a class, they came up with more than three dozen different bond issuances. So the downside is for every company, you might have one or maybe two 
share classes of stock, but you might have dozens of different bond issuances and those bonds are very lightly traded. There's not a whole lot of liquidity there. And so that's why most bond markets are, as we say, over-the-counter markets, meaning they're trading amongst dealers. However, there are a few bond exchanges that allow the trading of corporate bonds. So, for example, the New York Stock Exchange, the Tel Aviv Exchange, both of these would be examples of bond exchanges where you can actually trade bonds somewhat similarly to the way you trade stocks. So how does a traditional exchange, specifically a stock exchange, work? Well, we'll assume that this is an online exchange. Well, I have here a rough outline of how a, a traditional exchange works. You have the exchange, which might involve servers. So for example, with NASDAQ, you have some servers in New Jersey and any broker dealer, so brokers handle their clients' orders, dealers are trading on their own behalf. So a lot of brokers are also dealers. So you have a series of these broker dealers connecting to the NASDAQ server and they might have a series of clients. So if client one wants to buy 100 shares of Ford, they'll send that order into their broker's uh, platform. So let's say their broker is Robinhood. That broker might fill that order themselves, or if they can't fill it or don't want to fill it, they'll send it to the exchange where that order is added into the order book. And if there's another sell order for 100 shares at by this broker dealer, broker dealer six, uh, in that case, you know, assuming the, the limit prices are appropriate, meaning that this client one is willing to pay at least the asking price that this broker dealer is selling their shares for, then that trade is going to may, be made and it's happening on the exchange server. Now, this is an example of what we typically dub a lit exchange, meaning that we can see the transactions, we can see the order flow, uh, everything that is happening on the exchange is generally viewable. However, there are cases where we have these organizations called dark pools, which I'll talk about in much more detail in a few minutes, but a dark pool is literally just, it's almost like a private exchange off the main exchange. These are also a certain type of alternative trading systems, and broker-dealers and private entities can set up these these dark pools and trade shares off the main exchange. So let's talk about where and how these stocks are traded. So recently the NASDAQ put out this graph and it shows the a breakdown of uh, the, the shares or the volume of shares traded on what we typically dub lit markets. So markets like the New York Stock Exchange, uh, the NYSE ARCA, NYSE Amex, and the NASDAQ exchanges, and then uh, really the uh, some of the other exchanges. These exchanges over here, these are often what we dub uh, dark pools or wholesalers buying up order flow. So I'll, again, I'll talk about this side of the, the graph in a little more detail in a bit, but uh, when we typically teach uh, a first level in investments class, we tend to focus on the lit side of the market where we know the, the price that was paid for a given uh, block of shares on the, the dark side of the market, the, the unlit side of the market, if you will. You can have a lot of different players here. Uh, dark pools, like I said, uh, these are places where shares are traded off the main exchange and the, uh, the, a lot of the data associated with the transactions in the dark pool is, is not available for viewing. So what is a dark pool? Well, a dark pool is a privately organized financial forum or exchange for trading securities. Uh, as I said, these organizations are often dubbed ATSs or alternative trading systems, and these are required to be registered with the SEC, but they're notably not exchanges. So just for context, there's about 13 main exchanges in the U.S., but there's rumored to be, I think, something like 60 different dark pools. Uh, now, there's a lot of reasons why these dark pools exist. So let's start with some of the most important benefits of dark pools. First, if you're trying to buy up a large stake in a company, let's say you are trying to buy a toehold investment in, well, we'll use Ford, for example. If you want to buy a toehold in investment of Ford, 
and that's usually up to about 5% of the shares outstanding, you might not want other investors knowing that you're buying up a large number of shares because any investor with any intelligence who knows that you're intent on buying shares is going to front run you and buy those shares and then try and sell those shares to you at a higher price. So the first benefit of dark pools is that they minimize information leakage. Uh, your trades are not being disclosed uh, or the price of those trades is not being disclosed on the exchange. Another big advantage of dark pools is that they're often viewed as reducing the market impact of trades. So again, if you're trying to buy a large block of shares, if you're doing that on the public markets, you, as you're buying up shares, at some point, the number of traders who are offering, let's say, Ford shares for $15 a share might diminish. You know, there's only so many people who are willing to sell their shares as of right now or that have outstanding orders, uh, sell orders for Ford shares at $15 or anything close to $15. If you're trying to buy up a large number of shares at $15, very quickly you're going to exhaust exhaust all of those shares and you're going to have to pay a higher price in order to incentivize other traders, other investors to part with their shares. So you may have to buy for $16, $17, $18. The benefit of dark pools is that there may be an additional source of investors willing to part with those shares. So for example, you may find uh, another market of investors that are willing to sell their shares for $15 and so you can access that market. So it these dark pools, they reduce the total market impact of very large orders. Another commonly stated advantage of dark pools is that they control costs. If you're trading amongst a certain group of traders, you might be able to reduce the costs associated with certain trades. You know, maybe the exchange is charging you a certain amount uh, for trades, or there may be some other costs associated with trading on the main exchange. Now, the downside to dark pools, or I guess I should say downsides, are numerous. First, unlike exchanges where we can see the price that was paid for each sale or trade of, of shares or whatever security we're talking about, uh, in a dark pool, you don't see that. You don't see the price that was paid. You don't see the, the volume. Uh, the SEC did pass a law several years ago that required total volume to be reported, but there is a distinct lack of transparency when it comes to trades on dark pools. Another big con or drawback of dark pools is that they fragment the market. I mean, if you only have one exchange where investors are trading, you could theoretically have a much more liquid market, but if half the traders are trading on the main exchange and half are trading on several in several different dark pools, that market fragmentation reduces the liquidity of the overall market. So, you know, you might have to have access to all the dark pools and the main exchange in order to have full liquidity. Uh, so this is actually a drawback of dark pools. Now, the fragmentation of trading is certainly noticeable over the last several decades. Uh, note, I mean, certainly uh, more noticeable in the last decade, if I'm being honest. Uh, so if we wanted to see just how bad that fragmentation has gotten, this is a, a graphic that Bloomberg put out a while back, and it shows the percentage or the volume of trading on the main exchanges that we think of, the New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, and BATS, versus dark pools. And as you can see, there's been a noticeable rise in the trading on dark pools and a decline in the trading of or the volume of shares traded on lit markets, uh, certainly in this 2011 to 2014 period. Uh, I would expect this, this has certainly continued uh, in, in the last couple of years. All right, let's turn our attention to some of the other changes that have occurred in, in the markets. And we'll, we'll focus specifically on the lit markets, the actual exchanges themselves. So let's start off with the New York Stock Exchange, or I'll refer to it as the NYSE for short. Okay, so the NYSE, it's had a pretty interesting history in the last 20 years. It's been involved in several acquisitions or uh, mergers, certainly some big ones. In 2006, the NYSE acquired Archipelago Holdings. And Archipelago, when this 
acquisition happened, the New York Stock Exchange actually became publicly traded. So you can actually trade shares of the New York Stock Exchange uh, at that time. And one of the stated reasons why the NYSE acquired Archipelago is because of their technology. Shortly after this acquisition, almost every single stock that the New York Stock Exchange offered could have been traded electronically. And the, the resulting exchange that was created from this particular acquisition is what we typically refer to today as NYSE ARCA. And this particular exchange is where a lot of the exchange-traded funds uh, and other exchange-traded products are listed. So if you're looking to invest in, let's say, uh, an S&P 500 ETF, chances are it's going to be trading on NYSE ARCA. The next major acquisition that occurred with respect to the NYSE is its, its merger with Euronext. Remember, that's one of the big European exchanges. Uh, so that occurred in early 2007, and this created the organization NYSE Euronext. Uh, this didn't last too many years, though, because the NYSE or NYSE Euronext was acquired by ICE, or Intercontinental Exchange, in 2013. And so that's really where the New York Stock Exchange is now. It's, it's owned by ICE. So as you can see, there's a lot of movement in the world of exchanges. So I thought it'd be a good idea to give you a formal rundown of what stock exchanges are run by the two biggest exchange companies in the U.S. So we'll start with the New York Stock Exchange. I mean, their traditional exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, is the most liquid market in the world, but there are a lot of other exchanges overseen by the NYSE. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have NYSE ARCA, and that is the primary trading platform for a lot of ETFs. Next, we have NYSE American, and this is what was formerly known as the American Stock Exchange. So back in the the, we'll say the olden days, I mean decades ago, there were three main U.S. exchanges. You had the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, which primarily was for small, smaller cap firms, and you had the NASDAQ. Well, the NYSE acquired the American Stock Exchange, and that became NYSE American, which still allows the trading of smaller cap firms. The next exchange run by the New York Stock Exchange is NYSE National. And like I said, there's been this period of M&A in the exchange world. Uh, so NYSE National used to be the Cincinnati Stock Exchange. And there's, I hate to say, very, very minute differences in uh, the, you know, what the technology behind NYSE National and uh, some of these other exchanges. Uh, this is where we start to get into market microstructure, but the, the, the fee structure for uh, these stock for this particular exchange is different than with respect to uh, the, the main exchange. And lastly, we have NYSE Chicago. And this was formerly the Chicago Stock Exchange, although now it supports the, the trading of a lot of the New York Stock Exchange's derivatives. So if you hear about an uh, exchange-traded derivative, chances are it might be listed on the NYSE Chicago. Now, with respect to the NASDAQ, there are really three main exchanges that the NASDAQ supports. First, we have the U.S. stock market. And this is what, when we talk about the, the NASDAQ being the second largest market in the world today, or exchange in the world today, this is typically what we think of. So it has several different tiers of firms that are listed on the exchange. Uh, we have the, the global select market, and this is primarily for the largest securities. So think Facebook, uh, and any very, very large blue chip company uh, is going to be included in this global select market tier. Uh, these other two tiers, global markets and capital markets, uh, they also exist. They're for uh, smaller cap firms. Uh, the big There's some differences with respect to these tiers. Uh, the biggest ones are with respect to liquidity, uh, financial uh, requirements, and then governance requirements. So the global select market uh, securities are going to have the highest requirements, and these other two are going to have lower requirements. Now, beyond the traditional NASDAQ market, we do see two other exchanges, NASDAQ BX and NASDAQ PSX. And, and the big difference between these and the, the main exchange that NASDAQ operates are the fee structures. So given that this is market microstructure, I, I think I'll skip the, the market microstructure.
All right, so where are U.S. shares traded today? Well, again, like I said, we have the NYSE, the NASDAQ. Uh, there are some other exchanges out there, the Chicago Board Options Exchange, uh, or the exchanges run by the CBO are they represent the majority of lit volume of U.S. equity trading today. Uh, one thing I should point out is that CBO it acquired about five years ago BATS, uh, and BATS is a, a separate exchange or a series of exchanges. Uh, it operated some of the exchanges you'll sometimes come across, EdgeX, BZX, EdgeA, BYX. Uh, the big differences between these are really in the, the pricing and the order structure. Uh, so it's, again, market microstructure, which could really change, I hate to say, uh, very quickly. So I, I tend to not like to get bogged down in market microstructure. Now, to give you a sense of the volume traded by these exchanges, what I have here are is a an up-to-date version or very recent volume of each of these exchanges. So like I said, with the NYSE, there are five exchanges that the New York Stock Exchange uh, operates. And as you can see, they represent about 23% of the volume as of the uh, 9.30, if we want to look at month to date, so month of September. Uh, it's, it's very consistent, so about 20.33%. NASDAQ, like I said, it operates three exchanges with some small differences. Notice that the main exchange is really the where most of the volume is traded by the NASDAQ. Uh, we also have SIBO, which again has four exchanges, the ones that were acquired by BATS. And, you know, very, very similar. You know, this, you know, they do handle a large volume of uh, equities um, today. And there are some smaller exchanges. So members exchange and then Investors Exchange, IEX, which I'll talk about in way more detail in a later video, uh, just because it is so interesting, but it represents less than 3% of the volume traded per day. Okay, so I've talked about the main exchange. I've talked about dark pools. The next thing that I want to talk about is payment for order flow. And this is something that made the news certainly in the last year or so when uh, people started talking about GameStop and AMC, and it turns out that the largest counterparty to a lot of those those GameStop or AMC, or as we say, the meme stock trades, was a company called Citadel Securities. And the reason this made the news was because Citadel was actually paying Robinhood for their clients' trades. So if you were a client of Robinhood and you wanted to buy one share of GameStop, and you put in, let's say, a market order or a, a limit order, it might not have been the case that, that that market or limit order made it to the exchange, the main exchange. It might have been purchased by Citadel. And there's a lot of reasons why Citadel would do this. Uh, this technique where they, they literally pay for orders from various brokers is called payment for order flow. And it really just refers to the compensation a broker receives for routing its retail investor trades to a particular market, market maker. Uh, so Citadel would be a good example of a market maker, or as they're sometimes referred to, wholesaler. And uh, those market makers, uh, those are individual participants or member firms of an exchange that buy and sell on their own account. So here they're, they're dealers. They're, I mean, they're buying up orders or trading on their own behalf. And there's a large number of companies that operate as wholesalers or market makers. So Citadel is one. Some of these other firms that you see over here that exist in the, the dark market outside of dark pools would be other examples of wholesalers. So Virtue America, Americas, uh, American Enterprise Investment Services, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of these are going to be companies that pay for order flow. So who actually benefits from payment for order flow? Well, there's a lot of brokers that get paid. So the top recipients are going to be organizations like TD Ameritrade, Robinhood, which again made the news because of this, E-Trade, Charles Schwab. Uh, so, you know, a lot of brokers actually making money off of this. 
the largest wholesalers out there are actually groups like Citadel, which represents about 40 to 41% of the market. As I said, Virtue Financial is another good uh, large firm. Two Sigma actually runs a fairly large hedge fund. And uh, there are some other major players here. Now, these brokers that receive payments in order to, for routing their retail investors' trades to these, these organizations, these wholesalers, uh, they've profited significantly in recent years. So, you know, there's a reason why we see this massive growth in payment for order flow. I mean, with TD Ameritrade, over a one-year period, it, that payment for order flow increased by about 24%. For other brokers, like Webull, uh, it was even greater. So why are they doing this? Well, obviously, they're getting compensation. They're getting paid a certain amount of money for that order flow. But another big benefit of payment for order flow is stated to be liquidity. So these, these wholesalers, they're buying up these orders, and they're essentially increasing the liquidity of the market. Uh, now, as these brokers receive these funds, this allows them to essentially eliminate the explicit trading costs associated with retail equity trading. So, for example, uh, you know, Robinhood has no explicit fee for trading. A lot of these brokers, that's the case. Now, one of the biggest drawbacks to payment for order flow is that brokers might have conflicting incentives. So a broker that's deciding what to do with a client's order, they may fill it themselves or they may receive a couple of offers for payment for order flow. So Citadel might offer two cents per order, but one of the other wholesalers out there might offer three cents per order. Well, if that broker decides to go with the three cent per order deal, they're sending their clients to that wholesaler and there's no guarantee that that wholesaler has their client's interests at heart. And that's obviously a bad thing because the price that those clients pay for orders might actually increase. Now, there is some analysis on this topic, uh, but the, the best analysis I've seen is actually from the CFA Institute paper from a while back. And what this paper shows is that after a, a ruling in 2012 where the UK regulator stated that payment for order flow should not be allowed, over time, the, the number or the percentage of trades happening in uh, the UK that had the same execution price as the, the, the quoted price or the best quoted price on the London Stock Exchange increased significantly. So what this really indicates is that after the elimination of payment for order flow, trades were getting routed to wholesalers that were essentially executing those trades at comparable prices to what retail investors would have gotten on the main exchange. So this is a very good thing. Now, the end result of all these changes in the market, see these mergers, these, the implementation of dark pools, payment for order flow, and new technology, is that trading costs have consistently fallen over time, really for the last at least 120 years. And when we talk about these trading costs, there's really two types of trading costs. We have what are called explicit costs, and we have implicit costs. And our explicit costs are really the brokerage fee, so the fee that you pay your broker in order to handle that trade. And that fee, it could be in dollar terms or you know, some other currency, or it could be in percentage terms. You know, you spent $15,000 buying Ford stock and uh, you, your broker charges you a 1% commission. So that, those are your explicit costs. Now, there are also implicit costs, but let's talk about the explicit costs first. Now, these explicit costs, they've certainly reduced over time. A couple of years ago, a researcher put out this graph that I really like, and it shows the average commissions on round lot transactions in New York Stock Exchange stocks uh, really for about a 100-year period. And as you can see, really af after about the mid-70s, these explicit fees, the commissions that brokers were getting, fell tremendously. And a lot of this is going to be due to the rise of technology, but you know, you also have other advances like the development of dark pools and some other techniques. So explicit fees have fallen tremendously. In fact, recently we've seen some massive news on the elimination of fees. So back in 2019, 
uh, Charles Schwab announced that it was going to eliminate trading fees. And as you can see from this graph that I took from Yahoo Finance, when they announced that they were going to eliminate trading fees on October 1st of 2019, their share price fell, I mean, we could say it fell off a cliff. Uh, essentially, investors were accounting for that new information that Charles Schwab would no longer be receiving the cash flows associated with those brokerage fees. Uh, so Charles Schwab was not alone in, this, in seeing this decline in their share price. In fact, all of their publicly traded competitors saw declines in their share prices as, as well. I mean, the average one-day return around this announcement for most of these brokers was something like 20 to 20, negative 20 to 25%. Uh, so this uh, this was a massive event when it happened, but it essentially uh, represented the elimination of explicit trading fees for equities. Now, to be fair, any other asset class is usually going to come with explicit trading fee. Now, there are other costs to trading securities, notably equities. Uh, we do have the bid-ask spread. And the bid-ask spread is the difference between the lowest asking price that people are willing to sell their shares for and the highest bid price that people are willing to buy their buy certain shares for. And the bid ask spread is represented by that difference. It's the lowest asking price minus the highest bid price. And when an investor wants to buy shares, let's say they want to buy 100 shares of Ford for $15 a share, but the lowest asking price is $16. So in order to buy those shares, they're going to have to pay at least $16 a share. If they cross that spread and pay the $16, that represents a cost to that particular investor. And this is why we say that the bid-ask spread is actually an explicit or an implicit trading cost. So just to give you a sense of how big the decline in the, the implicit trading cost of bid-ask spread is, or has been over the last 100 years or this 100-year period that we're looking at, uh, I have the average bid-ask spread in dollar terms for Dow Jones stocks. And uh, what you can get here is certainly a, a negative trend over, the last, over this 100-year period. Uh, certainly, the implicit trading costs have been declining over this period. Now, there is one other fairly large implicit cost that we often think of when we talk about trading, and that is implementation shortfall. And implementation shortfall is the difference between the total price when you decide to submit an order and the price that you actually pay for that order. And the CFA Institute often breaks that up into a couple of different uh, parts or costs. So you have the delay cost, the trading cost, and the opportunity cost. And the delay cost represents the cost associated with you deciding to buy those shares and actually sending that order to your trading desk. So if the price moves in that period, you that represents a cost to you. So if the cost to buy four shares rises from $16 to $17 while you're sending that order to the trading desk, that represents an implicit cost to you and your firm. The trading cost represents the cost associated with once your trading desk gets that order, what do they actually buy those shares for? You know, if they have to buy those shares for $17.50 on average, well, your cost would be that difference between the $17 and $17.50. So it's a $0.50 cent cost per share. And then lastly, the opportunity cost. So it may be that when you decide you want to buy those shares and send those that order to your trading desk, some of those shares don't get filled. And there's many reasons for this. Maybe they just can't find a buyer, a seller at a reasonable price, so they don't make that trade. And so the opportunity cost is the opportunity cost associated with you or your firm not being able to buy the shares that you want at the price that you actually you know, wanted to buy, uh, buy at. So you may not buy all 100 shares. You may only buy 50 shares. So there we go. So let's summarize. We talked about the consolidation of the main exchanges in recent years. So the NYSE now operates five exchanges, the NASDAQ operates three, but these are still the, the largest exchanges on earth. And we've also seen some changes in uh, the percentage of trades that are actually happening on the main exchanges. So 
over time, a larger percentage of, or a larger percentage of volume is happening off the exchanges in dark pools, or you know, there's other wholesalers who are buying up orders and making, and taking the the opposite side of those trades. And then lastly, this payment for order flow and the ability of firms to trade electronically is reducing costs for investors, but there are some drawbacks to this. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And if you have any questions, obviously, please feel free to reach out. And if not, I'll see you on the next video. Thank you.